We spend a lot of time talking about being self-sufficient in terms of growing food, but I think another really important element of self-sufficiency is actually with creating compost and becoming more resilient and less dependent on buying in compost to grow our food. I think it's important to give a little bit of a disclaimer before we go into this video because everyone's situation is going to be different. We all have different uh, access to certain different resources. We all have different spaces which we can use for making compost. We might be limited, we might have an excess amount of space. So whilst this video is really looking at how I plan to become self-sufficient in compost, I hope it gives you a lot of practical ideas that you can get inspiration from to then use in your own garden and become self-sufficient in compost, whatever that may be. And let's look at that definition. When it comes to defining self-sufficiency, I think Everyone has a right to have their own individual definition of it when it comes to growing food because it can mean so many different things to different people and I think that's quite a special thing and it's, it's good to have something that really speaks true to you. And I think it's a, the same actually for compost self-sufficiency. So it'll be interesting to hear what your definition is down in the comments. But for me, the goal of compost self-sufficiency is to create all of the mulching compost that I need for the garden and for transplanting. However, for now, I'll still happily buy seed compost because I need to perfect homemade seed compost. And it's also a journey. I'm not gonna suddenly become self-sufficient in compost by tomorrow. By the way, if you want to support the projects that we're doing on this channel and beyond, the easiest way to do that is to get your garden supplies from our online garden centre, hughesgarden.com, where we stock everything such as seeds, vegan garden beds and cold frames. When you're looking at compost self-sufficiency, it's actually a good idea to look at the different types of compost. As I mentioned before, I'm looking for a mulching compost, which is kind of that standard compost that you're looking to put down a layer of two to three centimeters every year when growing with no dig methods. But there are other types of compost, for example, inoculating compost or nutrition compost. The best way to find out about the different types of compost is actually in one of my favorite books, The Living Soil Handbook, but the author Jesse Frost also has a video about the four types of compost, which I'll link to in the video description. And I think it's just a good idea to have a little glance over to get a good understanding of those. So the next question is how much compost do you actually need to grow your garden? My favorite raised bed size is three by 1.2 meters or 10 by four foot. And if I'm wanting to add a mulch of around three centimeters of compost, it will require about 100 liters of compost or 0.1 cubic meters. So to put that into context, this is a 50 litre bag of compost. I would need two of these to mulch one of these beds every year. In this garden, including two beds in the polytunnel, we have 14 beds that match the 10 by four foot size. So 14 times 100 litres is 1,400 litres, or we will need 1.4 cubic metres of compost. We just quickly put together this bamboo and jute box this is actually 1.4 cubic meters, just as a visualizer of kind of the goal that I'll need annually. Once you've calculated the amount of compost you need, you always want a little bit extra in the reserves for transplanting, for example. So take that number and times it by 1.2 to get a 20% increase. And this should be your real goal of how much you want to produce. Quite rightly, the next question is, how do you go about producing that much compost? The first thing that you have to bear in mind when you're making compost at home is that there's a volume decrease. So these pallet compost bins are around a cubic meter. So if I fill that right to the top and I don't keep refilling it over a few months, I'll expect to get around a third to turn into compost. So from this cubic meter, I'd expect around 0.3 to 0.4 cubic meters of compost once it's all broken down. I think there's some key composting techniques, approaches and ingredients that are gonna make a big difference to helping my journey of becoming self-sufficient in creating compost. And I really want to open the discussion so we can all help each other become more resilient and also save money when it comes to growing food in a garden. 
When you just look at the amount of compost that you need to produce, it can feel a little bit overwhelming. But what I like to do is to spread the load a bit. You know, there's that saying, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? It's a similar thing with creating compost. One of the smaller kind of, kind of in the background ways of making compost that is a great supplement is a compost pathway. You can see this is now, is breaking down so nice on the surface as well. If I was to run this through a sieve, I would have perfect compost to put over each bed. And I know that if this is around 10 to 15 centimeters high of broken down compost, which it should be in around two months time, that'll produce 200 liters of compost, which is enough compost to mulch both beds either side of the compost pathway with three centimeters of compost on the top. If this compost pathway produces 200 liters of compost, finished compost for mulching, suddenly my goal of around 1.7 cubic meters of compost with the extra 20% reduces to 1.5 and you can see that you're starting to chip away at that number. One of the big issues with composting is sourcing enough material, which I'll address later on. But when you have like a bit of a consistent flow, for example, plants from the garden, veg scraps, maybe the odd bits of cardboard and coffee grounds. Lazy composting or cold composting is very simple because you just continue adding layers. Now the best way to actually improve the quality of that cold composting bin, which is what we usually do in this garden here, is to actually chop up the materials fairly fine because that's gonna increase their surface area, they're gonna break down faster, and you're gonna have a nicer quality compost for mulching that isn't too fibrous and bitty. Another really effective technique for making compost at scale is actually chicken compost setups. Now there's all sorts out there, for example, more of a deep mulch setup, or you can have them in different bays. There's a lot of videos that have been made by both Jeff Lawton and Edible Acres, which give a lot of different ideas for chicken composting. That's actually gonna be one of the key focuses at our other garden for creating compost scale. Now yes you won't get the same hot compost benefits however chickens are really good at eating weed seeds. So as a weed seeds are sprouting during the composting process or just seeds anyway the chickens will find them and de-weed your compost. So there is another type of composting which is using worms vermicomposting however this is usually really nutritious so this would be a little bit more of a supplement to mix in with your main compost techniques. I think I've actually left the most exciting composting technique until last because it's a side effect of gaining an extra spring in the garden and that's with hotbeds. So I've been filming quite a bit with a guy called Jack First who's written a book about hotbeds and we've got an online course coming out later in the year. But the amazing thing about it is that it allows you to start harvesting food in late February, March, April that you wouldn't usually harvest until May or June or even July. And once you finish that hotbed, which is a bit of a hot compost blend with actually getting two springs, at the end of the season, you have a huge volume of amazing quality compost that you can then use to mulch the rest of your garden. Earlier this year, I did a video about eight bulk compost ingredients as a push towards becoming more self-sufficient, just to give a load of ideas. But I'm gonna highlight some of the key ones that I'm focusing on towards self-sufficiency in compost. The first one I'm gonna start with is grass clippings. This has been the year of the grass clippings absolutely after the drought. Thank goodness it started raining now and starting to quench uh, the thirsty soils. But grass clippings have been great. They've been breaking down really nicely and they've been creating this really lovely compost texture in the polycrop where we've been mulching the tomatoes. And I've also seen it where we've been mulching other crops outside. So grass clippings are really important. I think those will also make a really good ingredient for chicken composting setups as part of a deep mulch system. And just before I get into a few of the other ingredients, the real trick I think is just to never stop collecting. Always keep one eye open for potential opportunities for where you can source materials and actually use them um, to compost. So the other day we saw outside a solicitor's there was a load of shredded paper and none of it was a glossy paper. So I think it's perfectly fine to put in a compost bin. We had suddenly a whole bag full of shredded paper, which is a great 
carbon source. Wood chip is another one I'm looking at. Where I am in this garden and the other garden, there's a lot of trees about. There's a lot of trees that need to be cleared for, say, power lines. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity to grow wood as a biomass. And we've been using the Forest Master wood chippers. I've got two wood chippers that were gifted. And they have been really important for creating a lot of wood chip to firstly use as pars that we can then a year or two later put on a compost pile to break down. But something I'm really excited about is something called ramiel chipped wood, which is the type of wood chip made from branches under seven centimeters in diameter, because this is where the highest concentration of nutrients are in a tree actually find themselves in the smaller branches, which makes when you when you compost it and it's more of a medium term goal, but when it breaks down in two to three years, it's far more suitable as a horticultural compost compared to chipping really big logs that actually don't have very high nutrient values. Something that Forest Master is doing is that if you're in a trade or you're a gardener or you're part of a community garden or allotment, you can all chip together to, <laughs> no pun intended, but chip in um, to actually collaborate and buy a chipper that you can all use as a great source for not just chipping but also for shredding to build up compost material. So if you're interested in getting a chipper I've put a link down below to the Forest Master website. Another material that's kind of related to wood chip is actually sawdust. We've got a lot of sawmills around us and you want to use wood that hasn't had any preservatives for example so ideally fresh wood or it's just been seasoned and yes it's very high in carbon but when I went to a recent garden where I was filming from the Inspiring Gardens playlist sawdust was actually one of their key ingredients for making one of the best examples of homemade compost that I've seen and they've been doing it for five or six years now and they say it's a great carbon because it's quite a dust it's already going to break down quite quickly and they kind of shake it with a sieve over the compost bins as they're building it up. So I'm going to be using a lot more sawdust in composting and also it creates a fine texture. So if I'm looking at maybe creating my own seed compost later on in terms of phase two of compost cell sufficiency, I think sawdust is going to be really important for that. Also just a quick nudge for a lot of us, autumn is coming, which means a lot of leaves and I'm going to be saving as many leaves as possible to use as a bulk compost ingredient that if I mix with the right amount of nitrogen or green materials will break down fast enough to create a lot of compost. Coffee grounds is another resource I have a lot of access to. It's a nitrogen, it's great to put into compost to break down and to bulk it up. That's something that we've been using a lot in this garden and the other garden and I'm just going to continue using it as a free resource that I can get a lot of. Obviously vegetable scraps are a key whether it's from your household, from friends, from restaurants, really important but I also think sourcing local kind of weeds. Something that grows a lot around here is bracken. Bracken is one of the key ingredients in Dalefoot compost along with wool. I want to look at there's a lot of bracken around. I want to go and harvest it, bring it back, again, use it as a free compost ingredient. Cardboard, of course, cardboard is one of the things that is suitable for so many different locations. I know a lot of people are very concerned about the glues in cardboard. Glues in cardboard are almost always starch-based, so they're created from the carbohydrates of certain plant roots and tubers, so I think they're perfectly fine for compost. Seaweed is also really important. I'm fairly coastal where I am. So after a big storm and there's a load of seaweed kind of scattered about on a beach, you can harvest a load of that. The best way to get the salt off seaweed is to actually lay it out, let it rain, and then collect it and put it onto a compost pile. Ideally, do chop it up, but that's gonna be a huge part. And it's also very nutritious. And the final ingredient that's gonna be really important is actually cover crops. I saw a recent video from the David the Good channel on YouTube which has I think some really fantastic videos that if you're looking to save money in the garden absolutely worth watching and he's experimenting with cover crop mixes so high biomass plants that he can grow in a section to then cut and use as a high kind of organic plant material 
to bulk up compost and to create a lot more compost. So I'm going to be experimenting that myself. I'm going to create a dedicated area for growing cover crops. I'll then cut them down at the roots to leave the roots in and then use these cover crops or these green manures to chop them up, bulk up my compost bins and help my compost self-sufficiency. So in terms of my self-sufficient compost strategy, starting this month, but mainly in October, there's going to be a, a important crossover where there's still going to be a lot of grass about, especially with all this rain, but there's going to be a lot of leaves. So that's a really good green and brown material that I'll mix along with some seaweed, coffee grounds and cardboard to bulk make a load of just a mulching compost. Yes, it's not going to be super nutritious, but I can mix in worm castings with that, for example. And at our other garden, there's going to be a real big emphasis on creating a really efficient and effective chicken composting system, which we're going to film the whole process to then release as a video later on down the line to just share what's been going on with that. As a goal, those four pallet compost bins outside the garden, it'll be really nice to have those full of ready to use compost by autumn of next year. Now, obviously I'm gonna be making compost before that and summer's getting ready, but that will be a really nice placeholder ready for 2024, which is gonna be the year where I'm gonna try and shift to using all of the compost in this garden for mulching and transplanting to be homemade. And I feel that we are gonna be approaching that goal. We've got a pile of old cow manure bedding and also old grass clippings that will probably create around three cubic meters of compost. So that's quite a significant amount as it is. But our big autumn goal is just make as much as possible over winter and have 2023 as a transition year. This video was a slightly different style because I wanted to just share a lot of the thoughts that I have around self-sufficiency and compost. I know it's a big challenge that a lot of people feel put off with when it comes to no dig. My belief is once you've transitioned to no dig, you don't need any more compost than any other gardening method. But having the ability to actually produce all the compost that you need is huge. Now there'll always come a point when you don't feel you have enough compost. This video right here shows you seven free ways to grow food with limited compost. So if you're in the middle of the season and you're panicking, don't panic, you can still get amazing results.